Tonight. I was just exhausted all the time. I literally could barely stand up. I could barely walk. She progressively seemed to get weaker, more tired. An ABC 27 special presentation. I wasn't really having any symptoms, so to speak. I discovered a little blood. I didn't give it any thought. I made a big mistake. Colorectal Cancer, a matter of facts. Sponsored by Penn State Health Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. Good evening, I'm Deborah Pinkerton. March is Colon Cancer Awareness Month. Because of increased awareness of the disease, cases of colorectal cancer in the United States are declining. However, colon cancer can affect anyone at any age. Colorectal cancer is the third most common life-threatening cancer in the United States. This year, it is expected to cause more than 50,000 deaths nationwide. In Pennsylvania, colorectal cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death behind lung cancer. Although the number of cases and death rates in Pennsylvania are improving, they are still higher than the national average. Why is it important to get screened? And how has genetic testing changed the treatment and prevention of colon cancer? You will find out tonight. And if you have questions at home, Amy Kem, the host of Good Day PA, is here to tell you how to get them answered. Thanks. Amy? Thank you, Deborah. Specialists from Penn State Health Milton S. Hershey Medical Center are in the ABC 27 call center to answer your questions until 8 o'clock. You can call the number on the bottom of your screen or you can email your question during the show to questions at abc27.com. Chris Ardell, a certified registered nurse practitioner, will answer your emails throughout tonight's show. All calls and emails are confidential. And I'll be back later in the show to share some of those questions with you, Deborah. Thanks, Amy. A York County woman was very surprised to find out why she wasn't feeling well. Here's Jamie Robertson's journey. All right, so we've got a minus 175. Jamie Robertson and her father, Frank, are board certified opticians. Actually, it's a minus 175 OU. They design their own brand of eyewear for clay target shooters. We travel a lot to different events and we make prescription eyewear on site at different shooting events, different competitions, things like that. Last summer, Jamie had to put the glasses down and take a break. She was sick, very sick. It was weeks and weeks of just not feeling like myself, not feeling like I could do anything at all. She progressively uh, got, seemed to get weaker more tired, she had no energy, just wasn't feeling well at all. Naturally, as parents, you know, you get concerned. So Jamie made an appointment with her family doctor. And then I told her that for about a week, I'd had just a little bit of rectal bleeding, enough that I was like, this is strange. But I wasn't even at that point very concerned because it didn't seem like a lot to me and just thought it was unusual. But I was, at that point, I was really sick. So I just thought maybe it was a symptom of what was going on. They found out I was severely anemic, so they sent me to a local hospital. Jamie called me from the doctor's office and she said, Dad, you have to come get me. Uh, they won't let me drive. My hemoglobin level was at 6.9 and they want, me to, they want to put me in the hospital. I was hospitalized to try to find out why I was so anemic and try to get that under control. I saw a lot of doctors. They thought maybe I was bleeding internally because um, I haven't had any injuries or anything like that that would have had a lot of blood loss. So they did, um, again, a variety of blood tests just to see if I had any illnesses or anything like that. Everything came back negative. During part of that workup, they performed a colonoscopy and found a mass lesion in the very beginning of her colon the, called the cecum, right next to where the small bowel comes in called the terminal ileum and the appendix. And once they identified that, they realized that uh, this was something that could represent colon cancer. When they said that it was precancerous, I, I just wanted it out, I didn't want it to get any farther than that, just get rid of it. Anytime you hear cancer, you know, you, you, you're, again, your anxiety, especially I think as a parent, is, is elevated a little bit, so. Because I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses and we can't take blood transfusions, they said that Hershey was better equipped to deal with that if there would be any complications. So that's when they referred me to um, Hershey Medical Center to have the procedure done. And the Bible Book of Acts, it just says abstain from blood. And so, you know, we take that very literally, very seriously. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't want proper health care. You, know, uh, you know, we want the best health care possible, 
but within the confines of what we feel God allows us to do. The referring physician felt that she may be a good candidate for an innovative endoscopic surgical approach to this called EMR, or endoscopic mucosal resection, which is a minimally invasive way of taking these tumors out entirely endoscopically. So no surgery, as we traditionally think about opening the abdomen with the suturing or removing the organs, all done through the colonoscope. Dr. Moyer told Jamie this procedure wasn't as risky as major surgery, but bleeding was still a complication. We did have to fully disclose the risk to her, and that if she did have bleeding, we might be in a tight spot. But she was quite solid about her faith, and that seemed fine to her, and she was able to get to a position where she could accept those risks. We were nervous. This is the first time Jamie's had anything like this done, any medical procedure, any surgical procedure and things like that. Um, so we had apprehension, you know, so, you know, uh, prayed about it, you know, just to, just to maintain our emotional control and just to hope for the best outcome possible. This is uh, the colonoscopy that we performed here at Penn State. Here is the normal colon as it disappears into the distance. But it's obviously uh, mostly replaced, almost 50% of it, by this large mass lesion. This lesion was so large that we couldn't get our equipment around it. So we ended up uh, having to use a technique where I injected uh, the lesion in several places with a very concentrated epinephrine to actually vasoconstrict and hopefully shrink the lesion somewhat. And that's what's happening here. It's actually shrinking. It took approximately 25 to 30 minutes to fully resect her tumor and to treat it, close it, to make sure she wouldn't have bleeding postoperatively and remove the tumor completely. The pathology report indicated the doctors found the tumor just in time. Even though this was a large lesion, it had the very beginnings of colon cancer, which is called carcinoma in situ, or more recently determined to be a high-grade dysplasia. So that's the very beginnings of cancer, but no signs of invasive disease. You know, I think it really helps us to to really understand that, you know, it's not just an old age difficulty. It can happen in young people, too. So I'm just, just glad that it, the timing worked out and it's, it's out. Just knowing that it's gone is a big relief, you know, knowing that there's nothing else in there right now that's going to cause any problems. After this procedure, Dr. Moyer diagnosed Jamie with inflammatory bowel disease. She is now taking medication to treat it and she is feeling much better. Jamie had a follow-up colonoscopy last week and there were no signs of cancer. Now, Jamie's doctor, Moy Matthew Moyer, joins us right now. Thanks for being here with sure. us. Okay. This EMR procedure worked well with Jamie. How long has this option been around? Well, you know, EMR was developed by the Japanese in the early 90s, actually, and it's been progressively accepted and implemented by U.S. interventional endoscopists over the last 10 to 15 years. Now most, or at least a lot, of academic large referral hospitals will actually be able to provide this service. And it's an exciting option, actually. It can remove even very large precancerous tumors and actually spare the patient the expense and the risk of major surgery. At Penn State, we, uh, we do this about 5 to 15 times a week, and we expect those numbers to actually go up as referral doctors become more familiar with the technology and how it's safe and effective. Is this an option for all colorectal cancer patients? Well, that's a good question. No, it's not. Although it is very effective at removing mass lesions, when a mass lesion has signs that invasive cancer is already in place, that patient should get a CAT scan and blood work, and they may actually be benefited by a more traditional surgical approach if invasive cancer is already there. That's because EMR is limited in the ability it cannot cut cancer out of the deeper wall layers of the colon without getting in trouble, and that's what limits it to overt cancer. If there are uh, cases that are hard to tell in between, we can see that patient in clinic with colorectal surgery and make a kind of a group decision. Now we've all heard about the importance of early screening. What are the different options? Well, that is a very important question. You know there are a lot of ways to treat colon cancer, but the best way to treat colon cancer is just not to have it, right? And that's what makes screening so important. There are a lot of options for screening, a menu as it were, and that includes um, the screening colonoscopy every 10 years, 
a uh, CT colonography every five years. There are other tests such as uh, an actual fecal DNA test every one to three years, and all of them are fine. The gastroenterologist tends to uh, favor screening colonoscopy uh, because it is the type that actually finds and removes the precursor lesion to colon cancer, the polyp. And although it's not perfect, as we can see on the graph, as screening colonoscopy becomes more widespread, actual rates of colon cancer have been coming progressively down over three decades. It shows it works, and that's important. Every average risk American should get their screening colonoscopy or whatever test they choose at age 50. As Katie Couric once said, colon cancer is a cancer that no one has to have. And what are you looking for? Well, a colonoscopy, really the endoscopist should be carefully looking through the colon and trying to find these polyps. You'll see on the left of the screen, that's a normal colon on the right. On the left is a small polypoid lesion down at 6 o'clock, and that's what you're trying to find and remove. That's the precursor lesion, and the removal of that is really going to arrest its progression into colon cancer. And um, that's really the premise of screening colonoscopy. Okay, Dr. Moyer, some great information. Thank you for being here tonight. Let's check in with Amy Kemnow in the ABC 27 Call Center. Amy. Hi, Deborah. The phone lines are busy. Folks at home, you can give us a call. It's 717-346-3333. Here to answer our viewer questions tonight, we welcome Marjorie Lebo. She's a certified registered nurse practitioner at the Med Center. Here's our first viewer question for you tonight. This person says, I'm sure this is a question that is often asked, but why is the prep for a call? colonoscopy. Why does it taste so bad? Everyone needs it, but why not make it a better experience? I hear some people only take pills for their prep. Are there other options? Well, it's really important for the colon to be as empty and clean as possible for the colon to be fully evaluated during a colonoscopy. If it's clean, then polyps and lesions can be removed. Um, fortunately, most bowel preps are very well tolerated. They come in a variety of forms, powders, pills, liquids that must be mixed with additional fluid to be effective. Um, the quality of the study is only as good as the quality of the PrEP. If you've had a difficult time with the PrEP previously, talk to your provider and work out a solution that works best for you. Very good. Thank you so much for Thank being you. here. We'll check in with you in a little bit. If you have a question for a specialist, you can give us a call. You can also email your questions to questions at abc27.com. We'll be right back. You're watching Colorectal Cancer, a matter of facts on ABC 27, sponsored by Penn State Health Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. Welcome back. A Franklin County woman had some warning signs, but never expected to be diagnosed with colon cancer. Here's Margaret Albert's journey. The car wouldn't do too good in, in Barrow and all the ice and snow. Margaret and Tom Albert have fond memories of Alaska. A lot of people that go there cannot take the weather or the darkness, and they leave the next day or the next week. We stayed for 22 years. They moved to Alaska so Tom could work with the Navy and study how Arctic animals can resist the cold. We lived in a Eskimo community called Barrow which is at the extreme northern tip of Alaska. Most people have only ever heard of Anchorage or Fairbanks. Well, in Alaska, Margaret had her first colonoscopy. She had to fly 500 miles to have it done. Everything turned out all right, except the bowel was not clean like it should have been. The doctor was not able to examine the entire colon. So the bottom line was it was an incomplete examination, but what was seen was okay. He said to me, uh, I, it, the colonoscopy looks okay, but I think you need in 10 more years to go get another colonoscopy. In the meantime, Margaret and Tom retired and moved back to Franklin County, the place where they met and got married. 14 years after her first colonoscopy, Margaret spoke to her family doctor about blood in her stool. He did a, um, a smear, a fecal smear, and found blood that was positive. He immediately said, I want you to have a colonoscopy right away. 
Unfortunately, uh, they found a, a tumor and it was biopsied. And he said that you have adenocarcinoma malignancy and I want you to have surgery right away. I had known that my father had had this and I said, well, I guess we need to do what the doctor says and try to get a surgeon and have the surgery done. The Alberts met with colorectal surgeon, Dr. Walter Colton. He said what one would expect, and that is you've got a malignant tumor. It's not going to go away. The only way to get rid of it is to surgically remove it. She would be an ideal candidate for a laparoscopic uh, removal of this tumor so that the incision would not be very large and that she would not spend too much time in the hospital, not have much pain, there wouldn't be much of a scar. I think it was only a few days later that surgery was scheduled and um, I, I was really impressed by how swiftly he moved. I was apprehensive like anybody would be, but I, I knew it had to be done and I had wonderful support from my husband and uh, let's go get it done. And so we did it. The way we perform much of colon surgery these days is laparoscopically, which means we use special instruments about the size of a pencil that have little scissors and graspers on the end of them, and they go through small incisions in the abdomen. And we first put in a camera through the belly button, use these instruments that are very small through other small incisions, and then remove the colon through a very much smaller incision, usually only about an inch and a half or two inches in size. It actually went very smoothly. And uh, after the surgery, why well, he, he called us and, and uh, told us everything, you know, what had happened and so on. The tumor had not spread into her lymph nodes, and that's what we usually look for when we take out such a tumor. But there appeared to be some small specks of tumor on the bowel wall in the vicinity of the tumor. And that made it concerning for having spread a little more extensively locally in the bowel itself. He said that I had stage three colon cancer because this cancer had worked its way to the outer wall of the colon and there were a number of de deposits on the outside. So that made it stage three colon cancer. The next step, of course, is to deal with the fact that this thing may have spread. Well, what does that mean? Well, the obvious thing is chemotherapy. The goal of the chemotherapy for her was actually to eliminate those cells, those, those rare but nevertheless very dangerous cells so that they won't over time, you know, one becomes two and two becomes four and four becomes eight and just over time, you know, a, a handful of cells becomes a large tumor. I was apprehensive, of course a little bit scared but I knew it had to be done. The recommendation I had was standard chemotherapy regimen because of her stage of disease and also because of what the molecular markers, the, this, these, this profiling looked like in her tumor. There wasn't anything that jumped out as, as being particularly concerning. You lose your hair. I didn't lose all of it. I lost some of it and um, you know, you didn't feel very good through the whole procedure, but I knew I had to do it, so I did it. It was a lot of praying and a lot of just trying to keep her spirits up and not letting on how worried I was. Margaret's last chemotherapy treatment was on her birthday. We went to the Hershey Hotel, as a matter of fact, and we had a wonderful brunch. It was like a celebration. I was so happy. That's a birthday that neither one of us will ever forget. Margaret has had CT scans and blood work, and all have come back negative. She's doing really good, thank God. Her whole recovery since the end of the chemotherapy has it's been like a steady uh, progression, you might say. I feel 
blessed. I feel very good and very thankful that this is in the past. Margaret had another round of blood tests late last month and everything looked good. And as you can see, she is doing well. Now joining us is Margaret surgeon, Dr. Walter Colton. Thanks for being here. Thank you. As you can see, the minimally invasive surgery worked well with her. How, what are the advantages of having this type of surgery? Well, um, uh, conventional surgery involves a much larger incision to take the colon and the tumor out. Minimally invasive surgery can do this through an incision that's usually no larger than two inches. And obviously a smaller incision means less pain, uh, there's less chance of infection, and very frequently the patients get out of the hospital in two to four days. Uh, patients typically do very, very well with the surgery and they're very happy. These days we're even doing minimally invasive surgery with robots. And talk to us about that robotic surgery. Well, robotic surgery is like laparoscopic or minimally invasive surgery, except instead of having the surgeon at the bedside, there's a robot that's holding the instruments. Uh, the surgeon is sitting at a console in the corner. Uh, his hands are in uh, a set of controls that allow him to move the instruments in the belly. Just and we're as seeing if, that right there. Right, just as if uh, his hands were there in a, in a very microscopic way. The, uh, the visualization is, do, is done through a three-dimensional binocular view. And the advantage of such robotic surgery is that the instruments themselves have great dexterity. It's just like having um, your own wrist or fingers doing the surgery. So it can provide for uh, much better uh, techniques of surgical removal. In addition, uh, the computer that the robot runs with can compensate for things like patient motion or if you uh, magnify the view, which is also possible, it'll compensate for tremors on the, in the surgeon's hands. It's quite unique. Can all patients have this minimally invasive surgery? Well, these days we're doing over 50% of all our colorectal surgery with minimally invasive techniques, including using the robot. But some patients really aren't good candidates, and most commonly that's because if they've had large incisions previously for surgery, that makes the minimally invasive approach more difficult because of scarring and adhesions. And sometimes patients have large tumors and you just can't get the large tumor out through a small incision. But generally speaking, minimally invasive surgery is increasing in its ability to treat more and more complex tumors and more and more difficult patients. Okay, some good news and we'll talk to you in just a few minutes. Let's check in with Amy though in the ABC 27 call center. Amy. Hi Deborah. Viewers, you still have a few moments to get your questions in. The phone lines are open until eight, you can call 717-346-3333. If the phone lines are busy, you can email us. You can send those questions to questions at abc27.com. We have another viewer question for, um, for Marjorie tonight. I recently read that the number of cases of colon cancer for millennials is on the rise. Is that true? And do we know why? Okay. It has been recognized that there may be an increased risk of colorectal cancer in more youthful individuals. Why that is, we don't know. More research needs done in that area. It is important for anyone of any age to talk to their healthcare provider if they have any symptoms of colorectal cancer, such as rectal bleeding or change in your bowel habits. Also, if there's a family history of colon cancer in your family, you may need to be screened at a more earlier age. Okay, I believe we have time for one last fewer question. This one's really interesting. I eat a lot of meat, like steak and pork. Someone told me this can increase my risk for colon cancer. Is this true? What is the best diet to follow to prevent colon cancer? There may be an increased risk of colorectal cancer in individuals that eat a high uh, quantity of red meat or processed meats. It's therefore important to eat a healthy diet, fruits, vegetables, whole grains that has been linked to a lower incidence of colorectal cancer. Even if you eat healthy though, you still need to be screened. Very good. Thank you so much, Marjorie, thank you. for answering our questions tonight. And thank you to all the specialists here in the studio answering questions. Let's go back to Deborah. Thanks, Amy. Dr. Colton still here answering a couple more questions for us. Uh, how is genetics playing a role in treating this? Well, any disease, including colorectal cancer, is a combination of the environment, and sometimes one might think that your diet plays a role in colorectal cancer, as well as patient predisposition to the disease, in this case cancer, and that means genetics. And so the disease is the consequence of the environment and the genetics put together. But the genetics is different between two patients who might have the same disease. And this touches upon the concept of personalized medicine. In other words, uh, because of the individual genetics, they're different in two people, the same disease might behave differently in those two people and explains why, in some way, some patients do well and some patients don't do so well. Uh, we frequently will test both the patient and the tumor 
for its individual genetics in order to then make decisions about treatment, and that's again personalized medicine. That treatment relates to chemotherapy choice, but it also relates to surgical choice. Frequently we will make decisions surgically based upon those genetic tests. So it plays a great role and an increasing role in regards to um, the management of colorectal cancer. The research into this area is very, very exciting and the Institute for Personalized Medicine at uh, Penn State Hershey Medical Center is a part of the research process where nearly all patients who come to the medical center uh, donate DNA in order to then be uh, um, evaluated for genetic predisposition to disease. As well as that, we have a biobank that looks at the basic science of disease in patients with uh, colorectal cancer using genetic evaluations. Dr. Colton, you've given us a lot of good information. The bottom line is colon cancer can be prevented. Absolutely. It's exciting to hear about these treatments that are becoming more and more effective, but prevention is still the best cure. Okay, thanks so much for being with us tonight. And we also want to thank you, our viewers, for sharing your stories and sending in your questions. If you would like more information or if you would like to schedule an appointment, call 717-531-5164 or visit online at hmc.pennstatehealth.org slash colorectal-surgery. Thanks for watching tonight. We wish you good health.